Hello everyone, um, my name is Tori Leonard. I'm a games user researcher at Big Fish Games in Seattle. Um, and I'm really happy to be here today. It's been a long time since I've been back in London. I actually got my master's degree at UCL um, in their digital anthropology program here a few years ago. So, um, but I still managed to get lost in Bloomsbury on my way here this morning, so I should probably come back more often. Um, Today, uh, my talk is going to focus on some of the projects my team has worked on at Big Fish, some particularly, particularly some of the projects that allowed us to try out different combinations of methods and more creativity, um, add more creativity to our day-to-day -day work. This is not a presentation of best practices in any way or groundbreaking findings. Um, this presentation is, is merely meant to encourage uh, exploring different methods um, and really experimenting when you have the opportunity to try out something new. Um, our, our team has gained a lot of insights through more exploratory research, and I hope some of the examples I share today might provide starting points for your own studies. I will start out with a little background of how, we re how the research team fits in at Big Fish, and then we'll jump into some examples of research projects where we've played with methods beyond basic user testing. I'll focus on two main research topics, long-term player engagement and competitor game research. It was difficult to pick topics um, because we've been lucky enough to work on uh, quite a few different ones, but I, I chose these two because I thought had at least a couple of examples, and it might be useful or interesting to some of you here today. Um, they are, of course, uh, going to be casual game examples, so a little different from some of the other speakers today. My focus on long-term engagement is really considering what elements are most important to the first-time user experience and might provide a marker for the likelihood that a player will stick around for days, weeks, or months to come, particularly in free-to-play mobile games. The second group of examples will be from some of our competitor game research, or research on games that Big Fish had nothing to do with. These games were usually chosen because they were seen as either direct or aspirational competitors for some of our own games, and we wanted to see what we could learn from what they did well and maybe what we could do better. I'll give two examples that differ in both their research goals and outputs, but were both valuable projects for our designers and product managers. At the end of this, I hope that you will have plenty of questions, which I'll do my best to answer. Um, and if I can't, I will give up my email and I will respond. Um, I hope that you may have generated an idea or two of how you might switch things up or try something new in your own research lab. Big Fish Games is a 13-year-old company that started with PC download hidden object puzzle adventure games. Um, some of our most notables in that genre are the Mystery Case Files and Hidden Expedition series. In the last three years, Big Fish has transitioned to a, mo a majority mobile casual game company with a much broader set of game genres. And I w it was a process that I was lucky enough to be there from the start um, and get to watch the company grow and switch to mobile gaming. Big Fish is both a developer and a publisher with in-house developers as well as a network of developers around the world that we partner with to produce casual games. This means the research team at Big Fish works as a sort of internal consultant group, um, and sometimes we get to work really closely with our internal teams, and other times we're really communicating across the oceans to, to tell, um, give user feedback to our developers in other countries. We tend to customize our work and deliverables dependent on the needs of each game team because of this. Our research team consists of three usability lab researchers, and we are hiring one more. Um, if you're interested in moving to Seattle, it doesn't rain that often. Um, including myself and two research analysts, uh, survey research analysts. Our most common work includes playtesting and player surveys, but we often branch out into market research, focus groups, web usability, and more. On average, our playtesting lab sees about 500 game testers. We conduct around 1,700 interviews, and we uh, gather survey feedback from over 100,000 of our customers every year. We work in a two-week sprint schedule. 
Um, and this is to help us stay aware of what each of the researchers is doing, but also so that we work in the same ebb and flow as all of our game teams throughout the company, so that uh, we can coordinate better with, with their playtesting or your research needs. At the start of each sprint, we, pri we prioritize projects in a backlog and select the ones we'll need to complete over the next few weeks. This means we often have project ideas that are not urgent or not technically requested by any stakeholders, and those float down to the bottom of our backlog. But these projects can be some of the most insightful work we do each quarter. So as soon as our other research requests die down and we have the opportunity to take on something new, those backlog projects get pulled into the sprint and we have a chance to work on something different. Uh, backlog projects are sometimes requested research, but um, with no real deadline. More often than not, these projects are actually ideas generated by the research team because of um, other, other related things that we've seen in playtesting or while talking with our game teams. Uh, sometimes uh, it seems like game designers and producers are making a lot of their design decisions based on personal opinion. Um, and when those, especially when those conflict with what we're seeing in, in game testing, um, we, we kind of like to keep track of those, those thoughts and add them to our backlog of things we need to get more data around to be able to push for changes that would make a better difference for our players. Um, whether or not it is the case that they're, they're just making decisions based off of, uh, off of their personal opinion, we find interesting topics to study by simply asking what could help them make a better and more informed decision. I've listed out many projects here, um, ideas that have come to mind in all those sort of ways. And that tiny, ugly picture is a picture of our sprint board where we have marked out all our projects and all the tasks that we have to move, move across the board throughout the two weeks. Um, these projects are, are ideas like uh, studies about monetization in free-to-play games, social gameplay, and then, of course, long-term engagement and competitor game, competitor game research. These projects are relegated to free time, or times when we have a lull in playtesting needs and a break in our stakeholder-requested surveys. These backlog projects give us a real opportunity to think creatively about our research methods and questions in a way that isn't always easy to do with day-to-day -day research tasks, like first-time user experience playtesting. There, there's less pressure to provide actionable analysis quickly, and we can take our time to test out different methods. Sometimes we don't accomplish a lot more than identifying the pitfalls in a method, um, and sometimes we don't have a deliverable to share with the company, but we always uh, make a lot of progress in understanding what we are really capable of, of achieving and what types of resources we can use to get better uh, player feedback. Now, let's jump into some examples my team has explored, starting with long-term engagement research. And a sip of water. <laughs> So our team has always faced a lot of questions around what will keep a player engaged long term. Um, what will really keep our free-to-play games enjoyable enough for people to return to? We tried to approach this question in a few different ways, and I'll share a few examples with you today. First, I'd like to touch very briefly on the game experience questionnaire, and then I'll provide an example of a long-term study of one of our successful games, Gummy Drop. The game experience questionnaire example is more about measuring engagement and identifying weaknesses, while the long-term gummy drop study was focused on following the player life cycle and understanding the shifts in engagement over time. So let's start with the questionnaire. I wanted to touch on this uh, because it's very possible many of you have heard of this questionnaire, and perhaps maybe some of you have used it. Is there any hands in the audience? Anybody heard of the game experience questionnaire? I thought so. I thought it would be pretty familiar. Um, the game exp experience questionnaire is a set of ratings questions that score a game on seven components. Uh, immersion, flow, competence, positive and negative affect, tension, and challenge. It was developed at the Game Experience Lab at Eindhoven University in the Netherlands. Oh, it's going too fast. Sorry. Um, I encountered it while looking for ways to measure engagement, ideally a way to measure um, engagement and its correlation to the game's financial success. 
Um, this was a major, major um, motive for our team because we have something like that already on the premium download game side. Uh, on the PC gaming side, we have a long-running game score program that includes a remote beta test and survey, which correlates directly to the first month's total gross bookings. So we're able to kind of predict, predict before the game is done whether or not it's going to be financially successful or if we need to go back to the drawing board and keep on working on it. Um, the beta survey score is used um, like as one of the core, core parts of the de development cycle for our premium games. So we kind of always dreamed of being able to do a similar thing uh, with our free-to-play mobile games. Um, it turns out it's much more difficult to model this um, than it was for purchase content in a marketplace we controlled, um, especially since not everyone who plays a free-to-play game is ever going to spend any money in a free-to-play game. Um, to tackle this problem, we started by looking at standard UX practices like usability scores, but found the old usability scoring tests weren't very applicable to games like they were in software programs. Usability scores could tell us, tell us if a player could navigate the game UI, but not if the game was enjoyable and sticky enough to return to. We think the game experience questionnaire could be a better starting point. We've tried comparing questionnaire responses in playtesting to the qualitative feedback we gathered at the same time and found it to be very reflective. However, uh, the small sample sizes in those kind of trial runs uh, didn't give us a chance to really test out the correlation between component scores and then eventually whether or not people would play the game for a long time. Um, right now, there are a lot of positives for the game experience questionnaire. Um, it would be great for first-time user experience testing and for monitoring changes in the component scores over time. Um, and it would also be really a great way for us to like push, push for and identify exactly which kind of overarching features need a lot of work in a game. Uh, however, some, some of the cons for us at the moment are the fact that the questionnaire may need some modification to be relevant for each game genre that we work with. And the more modifications we make, the less useful it will be for comparing scores across games rather than just scoring the game against itself over and over again. The questionnaire uh, can be uh, very long, especially for our mobile audience. Uh, they tend to have short attention spans with surveys. Um, and we might not be able to achieve a good completion rate if people are surveyed through the game rather than in our research lab. So those are all issues that are kind of on, on next for us to tackle with that project. I think the next important steps in this project will include launching the questionnaire in games to get larger sample sizes of responses and identifying which sections of the questionnaire need to be customized by genre. And we need to tie the questionnaire responses to game data, specifically whether players who rate it highly do stick around in the game or ever spend money. Tying, tying the game data to these survey responses is really the key to making this a useful measure of long-term engagement for us. We think it would be worthwhile to launch this questionnaire in survey format during soft launch or even after release, to gather scores from new players and then survey them, survey them again in a few weeks, um, survey the same players to see how their scores compare from the beginning of, the, of gameplay to further in, and then also see which players dropped out and maybe what ratings they gave before they dropped out. This might help us identify which components are lacking when players churn and would help us come up with a process that combines our qualitative playtesting and the quantitative game experience questionnaire score and gameplay data. In the course of looking into the game experience questionnaire, I found a lot of other resources for flow theory, immersion, and engagement. If anyone's interested in more detail, I'd be happy to share those resources and some notes that I took about them and, and why I think they may or may not work, at least in, in my context at Big Fish. Uh, the game experience questionnaire is still in our backlog right now, but I wanted to bring it up just in case it would be useful for anyone. I definitely recommend contacting the game experience lab if you're interested in seeing how it might apply to your work. Um, next up, I'd like to share an example of a long-term player study that we conducted. We've done this a few times with a couple of different games. 
Um, but it is very time consuming and it, it still provides good insights and some of which were unexpected or even may have been hard to attain in other through other methods. This project focused on um, long-term engagement in Gummy Drop, one of our match three games. My coworker Kelly led this project, which centered on following new players from install through four weeks of gameplay or until they stopped playing. Kelly was able to work with the game data analyst to track game data for each participant while she sent surveys each week and interviewed each participant every other week. I believe we originally recruited 10 participants but by the time we got them all set up with the build and agreed to the test, um, I think we ended up with six. In future, I would try to double the starting recruit for more depth and difference in players. We really focused it on match three players, which was kind of stacking the cards in our favor to begin with, um, knowing that they already really enjoy this type of game. The study revealed a lot more about how playing Gummy Drop fit into the daily schedule of our players' lives how it compared to other games they played, and what they really understood about the game. Gummy Drop is a match three with levels that are repeatable at higher difficulty settings. Players gather resources and rebuild monuments in the city, starting in Sydney. Through our study, we learned that these extra elements of replayability, resource collection, and monument building were not necessarily notable to players, even if they had achieved them to progress in the game. For some players, this was a draw, but many of the game team assumed Gummy Drop success was largely due to these additional game mechanics. In a sense, this was still true. Players liked Gummy Drop because they felt they had options and they were not forced through one linear path. However, they, their understanding of the options was not nearly as important as feeling like they had a choice, even if they weren't sure what the choice was. Players did not know how the features all fit together, and some did not realize they interacted with them, but they did realize that they could always open the game and accomplish something, even if it wasn't progressing through the next level. We also learned that our players looked for sales during short, short bursts of gameplay throughout the day, so that they could save up resources like lives for their longest play session at night, right before bed. This project took at least six weeks once we added in the setup time and the analysis and reporting, which is a long time to work on any one thing. However, monitoring gameplay data and weekly survey participation for four of those weeks required very little time. We can now learn from that project to make adjustments, spending more time preparing everything for the study and ensuring we have an accurate game data set up would be a few things I would definitely emphasize. This study was conducted in a launched game. We've wanted to try it with beta or soft launched games um, to get feedback that is more useful before the game goes out. Uh, but we ran into issues uh, where we were worried about getting, muddying the feedback with frequent updates to the builds, um, distributing unreleased IP, and then also we were worried that participants may end up responding to questions about different versions of the game depending on how frequently they updated their build. Combining qualitative surveys and phone interviews with quantitative gameplay provided us, gameplay data provided us with a better picture of our players and where they were most likely to drop out of the game. It also reminded us of the many ways to interpret player behavior in game data. Sometimes when a player didn't come back for a few days, um, and we may have thought we had lost them. It turned out that they had actually been playing that whole time, but they were on a cross-country uh, truck driving trip and were playing offline, and it, our game was one of the few games they had that they could play offline. Um, and then, or we also learned uh, to consider player comments in context. Like when our players describe frustration at only having three lives in the game, but then also describe the, ant the anticipation they felt when they checked into each of their games to collect free resources, and then set aside specific times to play each game later in the day, planning when to use those limited lives. This study proved to be very useful to our game team, guiding decisions on things like localized sales times, revamping feature tutorials, and maintaining the generous look and feel of the game. It was very time consuming, but worth the effort for a more holistic view of the average player who makes it into our long-term player cohort, so we could try and increase the number of players that make it into the game 
further and further. Our puzzle game teams were definitely happy to have this extra insight into what could be contributing to Gummy Drop's success. There's nothing like a little bit of friendly family rivalry. All right, next up, I'm gonna to touch on some competitor game testing research that we've done. As a research team, we're often asking game designers and producers why they've made one decision or another about game features, and often they will reference a successful competitor game, saying that they like the way other games have integrated a feature, um, and sometimes they seem to be plucking features from several different competitor games that may or may not necessarily fit together. We felt it would be more prudent to examine these games more closely, understand how the features fit together, to create the player's experience and talk to players of these games. We hoped by doing this, broad competitor research, we could find new ways to provide insights for our game teams and increase the amount of expertise that we as researchers could bring to our own games and development. We've conducted research on dozens of competitor titles over the last few years, and each project has been unique in process and depth. I wanted to show you two examples that were des designed to serve different purposes. The first example is a descriptive analysis of top sim competitor games. We were hearing whispers um, that we might be starting up a, a sim game, uh, so we met with the producers and identified four successful sim games that we wanted to look at more closely for best practices and ways to improve. We settled on Heyday, Clash of Clans, Boom Beach, and The Simpsons Tapped Out. We didn't intend to focus so heavily on Supercell titles, but it, we found that each was worth a look. And uh, it was really interesting to look at each one because it seemed that they had learned things from each game progressively. Again, we took the mixed approach with our methods, including long-term player interviews, researcher reviews, and a player survey. Each researcher played the game for one month while recording an experience diary and screenshots. The researcher review focused on usability, pace of introduction of new features, and identifying the core loop and possible gameplay drivers for each game. We invited long-term players, or players that had played each of these games for five months or more continuously, um, into our research lab and observed a daily session on their own device and interviewed them about their gameplay and attachment to the game, how they found it, who they play with, uh, all sorts of things. We also conducted a panel survey where we contacted about 800 players of these games to really, uh, to really gather feedback on the game features and their gameplay habits in a more quantitative uh, fashion. In the end, we were able to pull together a lot of detailed information about how each game was set up, what features were key drivers for long-term players of those games, and even some issues with those successful games that could be improved. We also ended up differentiating between what we called battle and building sim games and resource collection and sim games, building games both by looking at the game design and by analyzing the, the player feedback and habits for each game. The chart shows some of the differentiation between the two game types and essentially the two different types of sim game players we ended up speaking with. Many of our findings confirmed the thoughts of producers who had been playing those games, but we were able to add more detail and weight behind those observations, which the game teams found was more useful than relying solely on personal opinions for design decisions. I think the main benefit of this study for us as a research team was really highlighting the depth of analysis our team could provide beyond the first time user experience and beyond our own games and development. This project took several months to complete because we fit it in around our regular work. So in the future, I would want to definitely make sure that the games we are analyzing are going to have the staying power to still be relevant at the end of the study, both in terms of popularity and related to the projects our internal game teams are working on. Next up, I have a different example. We also conducted 
the competitor analysis project with a different final deliverable in mind. Two of our game teams were taking a lot of inspiration from competitor battle RPG games, but the teams would often try to mix together features from one game um, and then another without any real reason other than they liked how it worked in each of those games and not really considering how each of those features is connected to the other features within the game. Their focus was shifting every day and discussions about which features were most compelling were always based on personal opinion and experience and as researchers, we were concerned by their constantly shifting ideals, even changing which, which audience they were going after. We wondered if features from these two different games could be pieced together to provide motivating gameplay. We decided with a UX designer on the team that the most useful way to focus this energy would be to set up design personas for the game teams to refer to when making feature decisions. These personas could help designers make sure every new feature fit in and supported the needs of our desired players instead of the needs of one of the loudest people on the game team. Personas are often used for marketing and product design and are sometimes very specific. Like Susie is a 35 year old school teacher who lives in Texas and plays games for 30 minutes every day on her ride home from work. We did not want to get that specific about non-game habits or demographics. Instead, we wanted to focus on ident identifying the different player types by gameplay behavior and motivations, particularly in the games that we are considering our competitors. This study focused on Heroes Charge and Summoner's War. We conducted a researcher review of the games to familiarize ourselves with the game structure and then created a survey that explored the different game features. We found online forums with large groups of very active players for these games and posted links to the survey on those sites. We knew this would be a very specific type of player, ones that participate online with other players and invest more time than the average casual gamer. But we wanted to make sure we were identifying behaviors of highly engaged players rather than players that played casually and could be more likely to drop out of the game. The survey helped us identify three main gameplay motivators. And when we looked at the data split by those motivators, we discovered some, of the, some other behaviors and preferences that were different for each group. We created three player personas from this data to highlight the player types that need to be catered to if our game teams want to create a game that meets the needs and expectations of Heroes Charge and Summoner's War style players. The personas included the coach, the explorer, and the Olympian. Each is primarily motivated to play for different reasons and has different gameplay preferences and behaviors. If you picked out the average player, uh, they might not fit just one of these types perfectly, but they would be motivated to play for, more, for one, of more, one of these reasons more than any of the others. So these motivators are important for the game designers to keep in, in mind when they are making feature design decisions. One example might be that the coach is motivated by upgrading and improving his favorite heroes. The coach plays in short sessions very frequently throughout the day. The coach spends time and money on a core set of heroes and enjoys player versus player gameplay as a source of competition and strategic information gathering about the abilities of more advanced heroes his competitors might have. So when considering what you need to make in the game for the coach, you have to think of ways that you can give them motivating gameplay that is achievable but compelling um, that in the end is, is geared towards upgrading and maintaining and creating a really strong team of core characters. The game teams have already found these personas very useful for design decisions. The personas have helped refocus the team on creating a game that provides features that fit together to keep players of similar style games motivated. And the personas have reduced the frequent direction changes that were more common when the team took inspiration directly from whichever competitor game was at the top of the charts. Combining researcher reviews and competitor player survey data gave us the information we needed to identify trends in player behavior and game design. The personas have also helped our research team add further weight to playtesting findings and recommendations. We hope to recreate these personas once our own games are fully formed. The new personas will be based on our own dedicated players to make sure we can keep them happy and engaged in our game long term. 
After seeing the success of these competitor-based personas, we've added persona development projects for all of our games to our backlog. Not for early game design, but for our existing games to identify player segments and make sure that the new content they continue to add to those games will fit the needs of their existing players and influence player behavior in a positive way. These projects gave our team the opportunity to experiment with different methods and combinations of data gathering in a very low pressure environment. No one was waiting on us to provide a report, but the added value of our research was recognizable in the variety of ways we could apply it to inform our game teams. I think we could learn a lot more from working on these overarching non-playtesting research projects. Unfortunately, they often get pushed aside due to time and resources. We're a small team, and we try to be really flexible with all of our games. But I think that, we can get a, that, that these projects can be a great stretch goal each quarter, and it gives each researcher an opportunity to dig deeper into a subject that really, that's really interesting to them. So far, projects like the ones I've described have been an important way for us to test out combinations of research methods to gather deeper and more contextualized, uh, deeper, sorry, that's my thoughts. To gather deeper and more contextualized understandings of our games and players. These projects have also improved our rapport with stakeholders who find these qualitative reports entertaining and inspiring and who also trust our expertise more readily after seeing the broad scope of research we've conducted for teams throughout the company. Since we began working on these backlog projects and providing different research reports from our standard usability and playtesting, I've found we as researchers have a lot more background to base our analysis in and an increased respect from designers and producers who feel more confident in our recommendations beyond the first time user experience or simple usability. They feel much more confident than they did when we th they thought we only tested our own games in a very standard and predictable fashion. I hope some of this was interesting, or at least may have helped you think of projects that you wanted to work on. I can tell you from experience now that it's worth your time and energy to investigate these projects, and that may seem a little bit beyond your everyday focus, both in what you will learn and in how you can improve the flow of information from your players to your game teams. Thank you. Radio mic, so here we go. Hey. Hello. Okay, Laura. Yeah. Um, so you showed the sprint board. So are you working Agile or Scrum? Um, it's a kind of custom version version of Scrum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we um, doesn't always work for the research team in the same way that it does for uh, a lot of the more product development teams, just because. We rely on the product development teams to provide something for us to test. Um, and we work with so many different teams that it do doesn't always work out. But essentially, it works out so that we can pick a set of projects we know we are going to work on for two weeks and make sure that each researcher has enough time to really support each other on those projects and be aware of what each researcher is working on. Um, which can also be really helpful when considering mixed methods because I might find out that one of my survey analysts is actually conducting a panel survey that would, would be really useful for um, a report I'll be writing later next week. Something okay, like that. so on the user research side of things, you don't focus on releasing something at the end of the sprint. You just mm -hmm. like use the sprint to inform like the progression of the research. Is that yeah, I mean, we, we still have the you know, end, of, end of sprint like recap yeah. where we, we discuss with ourselves what we've accomplished and what we need to do better and move forward with, um, which can also be really useful. But for the most part, it's just to keep us moving in the same ebb and flow as our product teams and aware of what each of our, our researchers is working on. OK, cool. Thanks. Thanks. I love to see the variety of methods that you're using. Um, and I had a question about what kinds of things that you approach with uh, in-house lab testing versus surveys. 
Um, what do you get out of those different types of work that's different when would you use one rather than the other? Okay. Um, uh, sometimes we do both. Um, sometimes we'll have a kind of research question that we're not sure how to approach and we'll start by bringing players into the lab and, and that gives us the opportunity to really go really broad and, and see, where, see where our questions take us and take our time to interview the players and see what kinds of things we really want to ask. So you would maybe drive some of the survey things from your more close-up yeah, so examination? Yeah, we may end up designing the survey based off of what we, what we saw in play testing and we want to see if that really scales out to the larger audience. Um, for our team, our, our survey researchers do primarily player surveys where we launch them inside of our games to gather feedback about feedback, demographics, um, and experiences from the players that are already inside our games. Yeah. And then they also do like market research if we're trying to test out concepts or things like that. So quick, quick follow-up, when you do the survey research, do you find that touching the player in that way has an impact on their retention or participation, or is that, um, is that neutral? I think it's a little bit different in each, each genre. I, I don't think it negatively impacts retention in any way. I think that it can be a really big positive driver anything, for some be, games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we don't always often offer an incentive, but sometimes we do. So for example, we have a Big Fish Casino is a gambling app, um, and we'll offer like 10,000 free chips if you take this survey. Um, things like that, and we'll get 40,000 responses in two hours. So that's really quick survey research, whereas one of our games that's in soft launch and only has a couple thousand people inside of it will take two weeks to gather 100 responses. Um, so it's really, really custom to which game we're working on. Cool. Thank you. No, time for one more, if anyone else has a question. Cool. Sorry, in places, sorry, after. If you mind introducing yourself, Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Um, my name's Jorn. I'm a student at uh, Belgian University. Um, you said something about um, posting surveys on game forums and places where people go who are actively playing these games. Mm -hmm. um, so you said that in this way you can only get really motivated, engaged people, but um, the reasoning behind it was that uh, in this way you could investigate habits of players that already that are already engaged mm -hmm. is the motivation behind this to make the game better for those motivated players? Um, for, so for that example, I, I think you're talking about um, the, the persona development project where we talked to um, players of Heroes Charge and Summoner's War. And the motive behind that was that we really wanted to understand who those players were, what they liked about those games, what they did in those games, what they, how those games fit into their, their entertainment kind of lifestyle. Like, do they have five games that they play just as much as they play Heroes Charge? Um, so for us, it was really about understanding what motivated them to play those games so that we could understand if there were differences between different player types that were all equally engaged player types so that we would be able to make sure that the games that we were designing were going to include features that would be motivating in a similar way that there were motivating features in those competitor games. So would you consider, question? yeah, I guess so. So would, would the, the most casual players, the ones that you know, don't engage in the forums and stuff like that, is that a separate category or would you say that those players are also in one of these persona categories just less motivated? I, I think, um, I, I would hope that they are in, in those categories, but we don't know. So basically, we, we set up the personas to target, if we were gonna narrow it down to only getting the players that are gonna be playing every day and you know, maybe spending tens, tens or hundreds of dollars over time and playing for years and years and talking with their friends about the game, these are the three types of players that we, we need to cater to. Um, but I do think that especially in that example, the explorer persona is definitely your brand new user. Um, the person who's just motivated by unlocking 
new content, they kind of start out as a new user, much more of an explorer, and then once they get to know the game features, they might kind of lean more towards, I want to battle competitively, or I want to strategically hone one core set of characters more than just progressing and unlocking new things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you.